Hey everybody, it's Mr. Wagstaff. Alright, so we left off yesterday talking about, uh, what we talking about, Al Capone? Alright, so we're going to pick up talking more about stuff in the 1920s today. Uh, we're going to start talking about monkey business. Uh, it's the Scopes trial, and man, this thing blew up in Tennessee in the 1920s. Alright, so what happens? Boop, 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 boop. All right, so uh, in, make sure I'm at the right place. Yeah, yeah, talked about him yesterday. Boop, boop, boop. All right, fundamentalism. Fundamentalism uh, is a concept uh, used for religions. It's, it's not uh, co uh, connected to one specific religion or the other. So fundamentalist is like a, strip, a strict legal interpretation uh, of the Bible. And we're, we're talking about Christianity today, so, so I'll reference the Bible for, uh, for this one, even though all religions have versions of fundamentalism. Uh, fundamentalism is the belief that what is written is a true fact, that there is no interpretation, all right? Uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, in the Bible, there's a story of Jonah and the well, where uh, Jonah is eaten by the well. Uh, he has faith in the belly of the well and ends up being thrown up on the shore and survives. Uh, that is generally understood to be a parable, meaning a story of the importance of having faith. However, uh, a fundamentalist would look at that same story and say, no, if it's in the Bible, that means literally 100% that is what it means. There's a guy named Jonah who was eaten by a well and was thrown up. That That's an actual real story that happened. All right. So fundamentalists uh, take what is in the Bible 100%, literally, it is not an analogy, it is not a parable, it is not a story or, or, or a moral guidance story, it is 100% fact, all right? So uh, not uncommon in a lot of religions uh, uh, for a lot of fundamentalist uh, 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 versions. So fundamentalism in the 1920s had grown. So it's interesting that while society had gotten... Uh, more popular in secular society, non-religion society, uh, that there's also pockets of society that become devoutly religious as well. It's very common in American history to see that happen. All right. So what was happening is there's this new theory that was becoming well-respected called Charles Darwin's theory of evolution that uh, that stuff evolved over time. Uh, all uh, living creatures evolved over time. Now, uh, I'm jokingly labeled this monkey business. Uh, humans did not, on Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, did not evolve from monkeys. 100%. That's not, uh, uh, that's not accurate with the way people view it. Like, there was like a chimpanzee and then like they had kids and eventually those kids became humans. That's, that's not a thing. Chimpanzees also evolved over time. Uh, so th the theory of evolution is the general idea that humans have adapted to the environment and therefore we have gotten progressively better throughout millions of years so if you went back millions of years ago humans wouldn't look the same uh, because they hadn't advanced as much as we have today uh, and they would be more ape like creatures that is not saying that like so th those creatures that they say we may have evolved from they don't exist because they're they're us now like we just got better over millions of years uh People tend to not understand that, and they they want to say that we developed from uh, whatever. I, I can't justify what everybody else, the reasons for disagreeing with it. But that's Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. It's pretty well accepted today uh, that everything evolves over time. Now, here's where the issue comes in, uh, comes out with religion, all right? While most of the time people have an issue with religion and science, uh, uh, it gets remedied by the fact that, yes, there's this new science thing we found out, but God also made the science, so therefore they can, they can co coexist. There's a reason why the theory of evolution really struggles with fundamentalism, all right? Because in order for Charles Darwin's theory to be true, humans had to have existed for millions of years, all right? Fundamentalism believes that the earth is only 6,000 years old. There is no millions of years for people to, uh, uh, to evolve over time. So by saying evolution, then you are uh, disagreeing with fundamentalists who say the earth is only 6,000 years old as opposed to millions of years. All right. So 
Uh, fundamentalist, not a big fan of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. It's the 1920s. It's a good setup for this story here. So, uh, in the state of Tennessee, the state of Tennessee says it is illegal in order to, uh, uh, it is illegal. Let me make sure. All right. The state of Tennessee says it is illegal for, uh, schools to teach evolution. You can't teach it. You can only teach what's called creationism, which is, uh, uh, the fundament of uh, the, the the biblical version that God uh, created the the earth in earth in the heavens in six days and rested on the seventh day. Uh, that is all that is allowed to be taught in schools. Well, there is a group called the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. All right, they're still around today. They come out and they said anybody who chooses to fight against that and wants to teach evolution, which was a relatively accepted idea even in the 1920s, uh, if you get in trouble for it. We got your back, all right? So there's kind of like this standoff. Like the state says you can't teach it, but the ACLU, this big national organization, says if any teacher wants to and you get in trouble, that that, that will take up for you. This silly picture I put on there a long time ago. All right. So the guy who's going to end up challenging him is a dude named John T. Scopes. So John T. Scopes is 21 years old. He had just graduated college. It's his first year teaching. He actually coaches football as well. Uh, John T. Scopes says, okay, I'm going to challenge this. So John T. Scopes, uh, he goes in front of his class uh, classroom. I believe it's a biology class. Uh, now, he's already told his principal. He's already told everybody that he's going to teach evolution. So there's like literally police officers standing in his classroom, and he says, humans may have evolved from a more primitive creature over time. That's all he had to say. They like arrest him on the spot. All right. So, uh, John Scopes goes to jail, right? Like jail, like I'm sure he does it. He probably spends 45 minutes in jail. They fingerprint him and let him go home. All right. Uh, cause he's not like a vicious criminal. So, but he's got to go, go on trial for this. All right. The ACLU stands by what they said. Not only are they going to represent him, they hire this dude named Clarence Darrow, all right, to defend him. Clarence Darrow is the, like, the greatest lawyer of all time. Uh, when I first started teaching, uh, I could say he's like the Johnny Cochran of the time, but nobody knows who Johnny Cochran is. Uh, uh, I bet your parents do. Uh, Johnny Cochran is O.J. Simpson's uh, a lawyer in whatever. Uh you just know Clarence Darrow is the absolute best lawyer uh, at the time. So the ACLU hires the best lawyer to defend John Scopes, all right? Well, the state of Tennessee realizes, all right, they mean business. We mean business too. So the state of Tennessee hires William Jennings Bryan to prosecute Scopes. So you may be like, oh, William Jennings Bryan, all right, who's that guy? We've actually already talked about him. William Jennings Bryan, or we talked about him back when we talked about the 1890s. So this is like 30 years later. Uh, William Jennings Bryan was the cross of gold guy. This is the guy that ran for president. Uh, he lost, but he ran as the populist party for the president, trying to not have money based on the gold standard and was very popular. He is like the Billy Graham of the day. Y'all may not know who Billy Graham is. Uh, Billy Graham, uh, just let me just clarify. William Jennings Bryan is the religious scholar of the time. He is the kind of the peak of religion. He's a pastor. He's very well respected, very intelligent. And William Jennings Bryan is uh, is hired by Tennessee to go prove that John T. Scopes is wrong. So in this backcountry town in Tennessee, they're going to have what's called the Scopes trial. We, uh, John Scopes is put on trial, but what really happens is an argument over what is right. Is cre creationism correct or is evolution correct? Which one is it? Man, when they knew this, this trial was going to take on, people traveled from all over the country to travel to this little town in Tennessee to hear this argument. Like this is, this is going to be like the biggest thing ever. So people travel all over the country. They get there to uh, uh, this little uh, small town. On the first day of the court case, so many people pack into the courthouse. The foundation of the courthouse cracks. So they can't go back in the building. So they have to cancel it for the, the, the first day. The second day, so many people have shown up to watch this trial that they literally had to have the trial out in a, um, 
in a football field. Now, I have a picture of it. This is an actual photograph uh, right here. All right. This is an actual photograph of it. So it takes place in a football field. I don't understand why there's trees here. Like, I maybe I just don't understand the angle of where they are. Maybe the football field's over in a corner or it's just a stadium and this is where they had shade. Uh, because I would imagine a, a tree in the middle of a football field would cause some issues. Anywho, uh, so uh, this is is a photograph of it, and man, it lives up to to the hype. Every it's these two super smart guys just battle each other out, and the whole crowd is captivated. Uh, so Clarence Darrow, who's defending John Scopes, is arguing with William Jennings Bryan, who is the leading religious scholar at the time, over what's right. Is it uh, creationism? Or is it evolution? Which one is right? So Clarence Darrow uh, tries to prove William Jennings Bryan wrong because Clarence Darrow supports the idea of evolution. Clarence uh, William Jennings Bryan here supports the idea of creationism. All right. Um, so if you're captivated right now, like, all right, which one is right? So they're both belief systems. You, the, nothing is going to change. So in the actual argument, though, all right, uh, uh, he, here's what happens. So Clarence Darrow, in, in a line of questioning, uh, asked William Jennings Bryan, like, he says, so you're telling me God created the earth and the heavens in six days and rested on the seventh. And William Jennings Bryan's like, yes, that's what's in the Bible. That's absolutely w what happened. He's like, okay, so you're telling me in six 24-hour periods, that's what happened. And William Jennings Bryan's like, well, we don't really know what their definition of days was at the time. So instead of being like a 24 hour period, a day could have actually been millions of years. So, and then the whole crowd gasped. <gasps> All right. Because this is like your leading uh, biblical scholar and seems to go against the fundamentalist teaching, not Christian teachings, but the fundamentalist, the literal interpretation. Meaning if it says day, it means day. Uh, the, nobody's going to win uh, uh, in, in this argument because it's, it's both belief systems that they're arguing back and forth uh, with each other on. So uh, what's going to end up happening here is the judge is like, you, you, you got to be kidding me. So he listens to this thing for days. And William James Bryan sits down and thinks he's won his case. Clarence Darrow sits down and, and thinks he's won his case. And they both look at the judge and the judge is like, uh, are y'all done? They're like, yeah. He's like, uh, guilty. <laughs> because what was John Scopes on trial for? It was teaching this in class, which is against the law. Did he teach it in class? Yes, he did. And they never at any point tried to refute that he said it in class. He tried to say, should he have? They, they were arguing over religion, not whether or not he had done it. So John T. Scopes gets fined 50 bucks. All right. Uh, the ACLU pays the 50 bucks for him. He goes right back into class and starts teaching again. Uh, the next year, Tennessee passes a law that says, okay, you can teach evolution if you also teach creationism. But if you don't want to teach uh, evolution, you don't have to. You can just teach creationism. Uh, the reason this is really important is it is very symbolic in America that as we become more advanced and more freedoms and more uh, traditions are changing, uh, America does at, at the very heart of it, especially in rural areas, are very devoutly religious and are willing to, to fight absolutely over it. Uh, so uh, the scope trial is very important in showing how, as we become a more advanced society, uh, America is not leaving behind religion uh, in any way, shape or form. All right. So here's some other stuff that's happening in the 1920s. All right. Uh, so women start gaining a whole bunch more rights in the 1920s. I, I do need to clarify, by the end of the 1920s, women are not treated as equals. There's still some equality issues uh, today that, that clearly uh, exist, depending on uh, uh, your view of it. Uh, absolutely, there, there's still equality issues today. But women make a drastic leap forward in the 1920s of being treated equal uh, socially, all right? Uh, so an up-to-date trendy woman, uh, of the 1920s is called a flapper. All right. Uh, so they wore shorter skirts. They showed off some ankle. You think people, people lost their minds when they saw women showing off ankle. And when I say showing off ankle, I'm not exactly, this is, 
This is a picture of what the uh, the look was like for a flapper in the 1920s. This right here, like in the 1920s, we might as well be wearing a string bikini out because people lost their minds over this. Like, I cannot believe those those women would be doing stuff like this. Um, but, oh, yeah, pe people absolutely freaked out over it. Uh, but this was a very trendy look in the 1920s. Uh, if you also notice uh, the bobbed hair. So uh, having really short hair, I say short, by their standards, it was my, it's like a buzz cut. Uh, but it was a little below the ears, above the shoulders uh, uh, haircut, and typically dyed black. Uh, having solid black short hair, it was called bobbing your hair, and it was extremely popular in the 1920s. Uh, so women that would dress in the trendy styles that have bobbed hair, uh, they would refer to as a flapper, uh, as an up-to-date trendy woman of the 1920s. Where the term flapper comes from, I have no idea. I, I occasionally get students who like have done a research project on this, and they tell me different things like, um, like when would have the, there was like belt buckles on shoes that it was the trendy to not buckle them. So they would flap around and that's where the term came from. Uh, I don't, I don't definitively know, uh, but kind of like where did bootleggers come from that term, uh, the term flapper, there's no, uh, uh, one single, uh, acknowledgement of where that came from. Uh, uh, women started viewing marriage as a more equal partnership. Uh, so there's less of a double standard. More women started going to work after world war one. Uh, marriages became much more based on love and compatibility and less arranged marriages. Uh, arranged marriages were never really a huge thing in America, but there was kind of this, uh, pressure to marry in your own, uh, in your own class that is kind of going away. Women have more, uh, uh, ability to choose who they marry because even though there were not arranged marriages typically there was like a general checklist if if a man asked you to marry him and you're a woman in the 1920s and he was like had a job was functioning normal human and wasn't already married you pretty much had to say yes that's kind of how it ha ha had worked uh throughout time uh now women are like nah i don't like your face I'm not going to marry you. Uh, so women have a much uh, uh, more socially acceptable way of marrying who they want and not just uh, who asked them to marry it, um, uh, asked them to marry them. So there are less arranged marriages. But as far as arranged marriages go, it wasn't ever really a major thing in America to begin with. Uh, this is a picture of women like working in a sewing shop uh, in the 1920s. So women are starting to, to work. Keep in mind, a lot of men died in World War One, so there's a lot of jobs opened up. Uh, but like these sewing shops, women are making their own money for the first time. They spend on what they want to, and they're not purely uh, viewed as somebody that's supposed to keep the household and raise the children, and and men being the sole provider for the family. So women uh, are gaining more rights in. Uh, uh, in the 1920s. All right, household names. So, oh, all right, household names. In the 1920s, uh, there are quite a few famous people. Everything is going great, so there's some famous people in the 1920s. Uh, Charles Lindbergh, uh, we talked about him a little bit yesterday. He was the first solo flight across the Atlantic, famous for not dying. Uh, George Gershwin, uh, he is a musician who mixed old school and new school. Uh, he would be similar to like Elvis. So rock and roll, and we'll talk about it when we, in the 1950s. Uh, rock and roll is black people music. Like, because there's segregation. So there's a black side of town, a white side of town. Uh, black people created rock and roll, right? Uh, and so what Elvis does, who's a white guy, is going to take black music and just performs black music and then makes rock and roll, which was black music, mainstream in white society. Uh, and that's what he what he's from. Elvis Presley does not invent rock and roll. He just opens it up to white society. Uh, very similar uh, is Eminem, uh, who exists today. So, like, when I was in high school, Tupac and Biggie existed. Nobody really listened to, to rap, like, intensely it wasn't like a huge mega thing but even i knew who i'd heard of tupac and, and biggie smalls and, and who they were uh but about the time i was a junior about, about y'all's age there's this guy that came out called eminem uh eminem uh uh 
what he did, he was a white guy. I mean, Eminem's as white as, as white comes. Uh, and he does black music, but it's not pop music. It's like real, like in-depth stuff, like stuff that, that Tupac and Biggie did. Like, wasn't like Vanilla Ice and stuff like that in the eighties. Uh, and when Eminem starts doing black music, all of a sudden white kids started listening to black music because there's a white guy doing it. Once uh, people started listening to Eminem, they're like, hey, let's go look at these guys, Tupac and Biggie. Tupac and Biggie at the time had already died, uh, but Tupac and Biggie actually, they're, um, they actually ended up making more money after they had died because there's an entire new group of people that now bought into uh, uh, into rap music. So the same way Elvis took black music and, and, and opened it up to white society, uh, and the same way Eminem does it, which yeah, it's not really a glory. Like, like the music always been good, but the the racial barriers that that you see looking back on it is 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 crazy. Anyway, uh, so George Gershwin did a lot of the, the same stuff. He's a white guy in the 1920s who played a lot of uh, classical music with new school music uh, and kind of mixed them together and kind of bridged the gap uh, at the time as much as the 1920s uh, w would allow for. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, she is a very famous artist. Uh, so I got some pictures here. This is Charles Lindbergh, first guy to fly across the country. This is George Gershwin, uh, did old school and new school. Georgia O'Keeffe, she painted a lot of cityscapes. This here is one of Georgia O'Keeffe's multi-million dollar paintings. I, I, I don't understand. I don't, I, I, that's, I, I don't want to be critical of art because could I do that? No, no, I, I couldn't be, but I, I don't know why that's, I don't know why that's, that's awesome. I, I, I don't get it. So sorry. All right. Writers at the time. F Scott Fitzgerald. So here's the story of F Scott Fitzgerald. He wrote the great Gatsby. Uh, so, uh, if you there's also a movie that came out of it with the, with the Great Gatsby with Leonardo DiCaprio it came out a, a few years ago, and it just basically talks about the gloriousness of the 1920s. Uh, uh, Edna Saint Vincent Millay is a poet. She wrote about how awesome it was to be young and beautiful in the 1920s. Uh, yet her name is Edna. And you're like Edna? Ain't nobody cute ever been named Edna. Well. I'm about to blow your minds. Y'all listening? So, you know your grandparents? They're like super old. They used to be young. And I bet some of them were good looking. Like, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. Doris? Nope. Uh, probably. So, while Edna, definitely a super old person named today, in the 1920s, Edna was a... Uh, uh, a young person's name. And she wrote poems about how great it was to be young and pretty in the 1920s. Um, Ernest Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway wrote a farewell to arms. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, uh, Ernest Hemingway. I'll do it here. Uh, so this is F Scott Fitzgerald, uh, and the story of him and Zelda, Edna St. Vincent Millay, who wrote poems about how great it was to be young and beautiful in the 1920s. And then Ernest Hemingway. So you may have heard of Ernest Hemingway and you're like, oh, he's like a dude who wrote books and stuff. Yes, he was. And you're like, oh, I bet he's a nerd. Not really. So Ernest Hemingway, <clears throat> very good author. He fought in World War I. Uh, when he gets back, he is super against fighting, super against war uh, in World War I. So he wrote a book called A Farewell to Arms, super against war. Keep in mind, this is the 1920s. We're very nativist, isolationist, want to stay out of a war. So it makes him real popular when he writes books about how awful war is. So Ernest Hemingway, he writes uh, a farewell to arms and writes a considerable other amounts of books that are very anti-war books about how awful war is. What's interesting uh, about that is that Ernest Hemingway now gets his reputation of like this like author like you would Ernest Hemingway you think he would look like F. Scott Fitzgerald. Nah, you don't mess with Ernest Hemingway. He's like type of guy that go like kill a bear with his bare hands. I mean, if you don't. Let me explain to this. This dude in this picture is wearing a turtleneck and you didn't judge him for it because he's a man's man. Like when you can rock out a straight up turtleneck, 
and you're like, yep, you can pull that off, you're a real man. Uh, so Ernest Hemingway's a uh, much more of a tough guy figure than I think he gets a lot of credit for in, uh, in history. All right. So this is a really important time period as well in the, in the 1920s. It's called the Harlem Renaissance. So New York City is divided up into five sections. They're called boroughs. Uh, oh gosh, let's see if I can do it off the top of my head. You got Manhattan, you have the Bronx, you have Brooklyn, and you have Queens, and then the fifth one is Harlem. Look at me. Good job, self. All right, so uh, New York is still segregated at the time. If you're black, the only place you can live in New York City is in Harlem. So Harlem is like an exclusively black part of New York City. Uh, so it's... There's a time period that's going to be called the Harlem Renaissance, and, it, and it's really cool, and it's very important for American history, and especially African American history, all right? Uh, and I need to specifically clarify African American versus black. When, when I say black, I'm talking about, like, color of your skin versus color, because you have black people in all different countries, and, and for U.S. history, as we've talked about, I, a lot of times, you got to use the term black, otherwise it gets confusing, like... In Germany, uh, Hitler uh, killed a whole bunch of black people in the Holocaust, but did not kill a single African-American. And the reason that gets confusing is because African-Americans only exist in America. Uh, so uh, I use black uh, uh, for this class. Typically, when I'm talking about a, a race of people, uh, like black and white. Uh, African-Americans is, is when it's a culture in America. And this absolutely is an African-American movement. And it's, it's really awesome because it really only takes place uh, in America at the time. Super cool. So uh, being segregated in a society, and we'll talk more about it when we get to the civil rights movement, the people that are segregated into this society are treated uh, kind of as second-class citizens. In Harlem, the entire city of Harlem decides, nah, we're not going to be what they expect us to be. Uh, how about us, instead of trying to constantly try to uh, have white society or white culture in our own society? How about African-American society look at what our strengths are, what we can offer to society, and, and create our own culture instead of trying to get the scraps from a society that's treating us as second-class citizens? Because of this, you're going to see the Harlem Renaissance come out, a very unique culture uh, that's going to start. It's called the Harlem Renaissance because it spreads all over the country, where African-Americans are going to focus on their strength, their heritage, their culture, and build that up uh, as opposed to constantly trying to be whatever white society and white culture uh, convinces them uh, is good. So the Harlem Renaissance is a literary and artistic movement that celebrates African-American culture. Uh, it it's the, the whole uh, black is beautiful mentality where it's going to focus on your own culture instead of trying to appease another culture by being as much like them as possible. So the Harlem Renaissance is a time period in the 1920s uh, of, uh, of New York City where there is an explosion of very famous people and, and all types of artists and political leaders that are going to come out of Harlem at the time. Uh, so this is just a, a picture in Harlem in the 1920s of uh, one of the theaters. All right. So there's a handful of guys uh, that, that's going to come out. Uh, James Weldon Johnson. All right. Uh, this is a picture of James Weldon Johnson right here. So James Weldon Johnson uh, comes out of Harlem, and he's going to be the head secretary of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People that's, that's still around today. Uh so being head secretary means you're like the leader of it. They use secretary as the term for, for, for leader in the NAACP. So uh, James Weldon Johnson comes out and he effectively pushes to have laws on lynching. Saying that, hey, if you lynch somebody, you get in trouble. Think about that. He has to push through a law that says lynching is bad because it didn't exist now so let, let me clarify that before I, I oversimplify that he basically says if a lynching takes place all right uh the new law is the local police aren't the ones to go investigate it all right uh because they found out with the kkk that when a lynching takes place a lot of times the local authorities knew about it 
if they didn't even partake in it. So when a lynching takes place, then the federal government is going to get involved and go and investigate it and see who needs to be held accountable for it, uh, which does do a lot to uh, prevent a lot of lynchings when they know there's actually going to be somebody that's going to show up uh, and investigate it. So that is uh, uh, Marcus Garvey, or sorry, that, that is James Weldon Johnson. This is Marcus Garvey. Okay. So Marcus Garvey uh, supports this Back to Africa movement. Uh, this is not uncommon in most civil rights movements uh, in the United States with African Americans. There ends up being a Back to Af Africa movement with this uh, a thought process that if white people don't want us here, fine, let's leave and go back to Africa. And it is a it usually gets a big enough movement that we talk about it in history books. The problem is, is the logistics behind it, uh, the amount of money that would it would cost uh, to do such a thing, on top of the fact that, like, it, why? Like, a lot of black people are African Americans, uh, if we're talking about specifically the culture here, are like, I, I, my heritage from hundreds of years ago may have been in Africa, uh, but I, I'm an American now. Granted, America is not cool to us at all, and we need to work here to fix it, but Going back to Africa and starting over there, I don't know if logistically, if that's the best case scenario, because people here don't know anything about there and the finances to be able to set it up. But uh, there's always usually a movement behind it. And this is Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey is actually a Jamaican. Uh, and he is a huge uh, attempts to organize this back to Africa movement uh, in the United States. All right. Harlem Rene uh, Renaissance writers. So I don't know if you guys talk about these uh, guys in English class anymore. Uh, they used to years ago. I don't know if they do or not. So there's two very famous poets that come out of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, so both of these guys are African-Americans. Uh, Claude McKay, uh, he's a poet, uh, very uh, militaristic in his poems, basically encouraging black people to fight back against these injustices. Like, like, you don't have you don't have to sit here and take it when it's when it's an unjust society don't sit here and keep being treated as a second class citizen you don't have to take it langston hughes on the other hand also a poet langston hughes basically was a very observational type poet he just talked about the hardships of the working class african americans and how tough it was being black in America at the time. Uh, so uh, he was, he basically just pointed out how difficult it was for black people. Whereas uh, Claude McKay was much more militaristic and uh, urged African-Americans to aggressively re resist discrimination if needed. Like not that it would be, that's your fir first step, but you know, by any means necessary, demand that you be treated equal and do not allow yourself to be treated as a second class citizen. Uh, but both of these men came out of uh, the Harlem Renaissance and were uh, very famous. So this is uh, this right here. This is Claude McKay. Uh, and this is like, like he says, you live in America. Does she stand by you? Uh, and this is, if I'm not mistaken, this specific one is having to do with World War II, uh, which we haven't got to yet. Uh, but Claude McKay, very famous author that, that comes out in the Harlem Renaissance. This is uh, Langston Hughes. Uh, tons of poems uh, by, by Langston Hughes, uh, basically just talking about how difficult it is uh, living in a, in a society and being African American in the, in the 1920s. While everything is great for everybody else, the, the discrimination of being treated as a second class citizen uh, really takes its toll on the average worker. All right. So the Harlem Renaissance performers. All right. I'm going to talk about Bessie Smith, Duke Ellington, and Louis Armstrong first, and then uh, finish with Paul Robeson, because Paul Robeson's uh, got an awesome story. Uh, so Louis Armstrong, uh, he is a trumpet player all right, called Satchmo. That was his nickname. Uh, he is the Michael Jordan of jazz. I realize uh, I have misspelled Jordan, and I probably need to rip down my American flag because of that, because surely I'm, I've infiltrated this society if I can't spell Michael Jordan right. Uh but Louis Armstrong, he's the Michael Jordan of jazz, fantastic uh, trumpet player uh, and a jazz musician at the time. Duke Ellington is a jazz pianist. Careful how you say that. It's a jazz pianist uh, and a composer. Uh, came out of the Harlem Renaissance. And then Bessie Smith is a blues uh, singer. She's the Adele of uh, of the 1920s. 
And then Paul Robeson. All right, so Paul Robeson. This is a cool story. So Paul Robeson uh, is a famous stage actor. I got a picture. It's a sketch of him. So Paul Robeson in the Harlem Renaissance. Paul Robeson is a fantastic African-American actor. He's the lead of like every play they have in, in the Harlem Renaissance. Absolutely uh, fantastic. Uh, he was, if you're, if you're looking at the picture, he was a, a great athlete in college and all these other things. Uh, so he is such a good actor that he actually is one of the first people that gets invited, one of the first African-Americans that gets invited from being in the all-black theaters to performing in the white theaters, all right? Uh, so he's like, awesome, knocking down barriers here. So he goes and works in the uh, uh, the white-only theaters. <sighs> Man, people were so racist at the time. How, how do you think people are going to react? Like the general public, not people that go see plays, because anybody that sees plays thinks Paul Robeson is great. But the vast majority of people who don't go see plays are like, they done got an African American there in that there uh, theater, and all of a sudden there's this massive backlash against the theaters uh, for allowing Paul Robeson to to perform in their theaters. So you can call people all types of bad things back in the time, and they call Paul Robeson like the worst possible thing that you can imagine. What do you think the worst possible thing you could call Paul Robeson is? Now. I have to preface that when I say it in class because I'm always terrified of what somebody will say. And But I'm sure this is what you were all thinking. The worst possible thing that you can call Paul Robeson in the 1920s is a communist. I know that's what you are all thinking. Uh, so, because if you're like, uh, is that worse than the N-word? Oh, 100%. Because using the N-word wasn't even, like, it was so commonly used in, in a hate-filled society that it wasn't as shocking. But you call somebody a communist, like, that's like a career ender. Because we were terrified of the communists. We just had the Red Scare. Uh, so being called a communist is completely uncool. So everybody starts calling him a communist. Enough people start saying it, people start believing it. Paul Robeson ain't no communist. Uh, but because they call him a communist, nobody will hire him because they don't want somebody that's assumed to be a communist in their theater. So not only will the white theaters not hire him anymore, the uh, theaters in Harlem won't hire him anymore. And, and he's, and he's out of work so much. So uh, it, he almost doesn't feel safe in America anymore. He needs to flee America. So he tries to go to England. He tries to go to France, England, France won't let him in because he's a communist or so they believe he's like, you have got to be kidding me. So he can't leave America. Uh, there's only one country that will allow him to come in. Guess what country that is. That would be right. That is Russia. Russia's like, comrade, come on. And, Ro and Paul Robinson's like, I'm not a communist, guys. I'm telling you. And realizing he has no other options, he's like, thank you, comrade. I guess I'm a communist. And he literally has to go to Russia, all right, and become a communist. Uh, and then everybody in America's like, see, he told you he was a communist. Once he's in Russia, he becomes a stage actor in Russia and makes bank in Russia. Uh, he makes tons of money in Russia. Uh, uh, typically, it's really funny. So in Russia, as a stage actor, you know, so in America, he does all these dramas and stuff. In Russia, he does a bunch of comedies because he has to be the dumb American. And that's, that's how he makes all his money. Today, uh, make sure. All right, so I got some more pictures here. Uh, uh, Louis Armstrong, uh, Satchmo. Duke Ellington, jazz pianist, and that's Bessie Smith. All right, that's as far as we're going to get today. Uh, see you guys tomorrow.